So as I've mentioned before, the cerebellum receives about 40 times more axons than it, it sends out. So the input is about 40 times what the output is. And that tells you a lot. It tells you that the cerebellum is going to take a lot of information, grind it through some processor, and, and issue a decision, issue an ultimatum, an output is going to choose between all this information and decide on a course of action. And uh, they're, they're the simplest route through by which information can flow through the cerebellum is simply that the input comes into the deep cerebellar nuclei, those nuclei down in the, in the depths of the cerebellum. And it is these deep cerebellar nuclei that leave the cerebellum. This is the only type of cell that has an axon that leaves the cerebellum. So if anything's coming out of the cerebellum, it's coming out from the deep cerebellar nuclei. And these deep cerebellar nuclear neurons are excitatory. They use glutamate, and they uh, excite neurons in motor control centers, such as the red nucleus that gives rise to the rubrospinal spinal tract, or neurons in thalamus that then project to motor control centers, such as primary motor cortex. In either situation, the upshot of this uh, circuit is that the motor control center neurons are excited. If there's information coming in from the cerebellum, it ex it, the, the net result of this part of the, this circuit is that motor control center neurons will be excited. And indeed, one of the features of cerebellar lesions is that they slow movement because this excitation, this very rapid excitation, is facilitates a fast initiation of a movement. So it facilitates the, the start of a movement. If this is gone, then the movement takes another moment before it starts. Okay? So movements are, are initiated more slowly and occur more slowly uh, in people with cerebellar lesions. Now, if that's all there was to the cerebellum, there wouldn't be all this interest in it. Um, that's not where we think the bulk of the learning happens. We think that the bulk of motor learning happens, or I, I would say this is for sure, the bulk of mo mo motor learning happens in the cerebellar cortex. So the same information that goes to deep cerebellar nuclear neurons also goes to the cerebellar cortex. And in the cerebellar cortex, there is a transform. I mean, this information is processed through a through very complex circuits that we've uh, that neurobiologists have been studying for for well over a hundred years, um, and it's an exquisite circuitry. We don't understand it perfectly, but it is it is really a beautiful um, uh, circuit, and. The consequence of whatever the cerebellum, cerebellar cortex decides, that consequence comes out through one cell in the cerebellar cortex. There's only one output from the cerebellar cortex, and that is the Purkinje cell. So the Purkinje cell is the only output from the cerebellar cortex, and where does it go? It only goes to the deep cerebellar nuclei. So this Purkinje cell contains GABA. It is inhibitory. And so it inhibits these cells in the deep cerebellar nuclear, uh, in nuclei. Um, these cells are uh, constitutively firing along so that when there's an inhibition, they lower their firing rate. If they didn't have resting discharge, then if they were inhibited, you would never know about it. So you need to, if you're going to have an inhibitory input that is meaningful, there has to be a resting discharge. And indeed, these cells have a resting discharge. So it is this modulation of the output of the deep cerebellar nuclear neurons that smooths the movements. So this is involved in, in pace and initiation. And this circuit this more complicated circuit whereby the cerebellar cortex does stuff with the information it gets and feeds it forward into the deep cerebellar nuclei, this is where the bulk of the coordination uh, 
uh, processing occurs. So let's just take a, let's go back to the slides and everything that I just said is contained here. You can take a look at this um, on your own. Um, this is another way to say that the per a, a, um, a pause in, in, in uh, Purkinje cell uh, firing leads to more activity in a deep cerebellar nuclear cell, which initiates movement. Okay, here is, here's the Purkinje cell. And what, what do you note about it? First of all, it's an extremely elaborate cell. It's got a lot of branches. Uh, the dendrites are, it, it's, it's a sea fan of dendrites. Um, and on all these dendrites, there are, it's not visible here, but they're just studded with, with spines. Um, this, so this is the dendro, this is the dendritic arbor. This is the axon. Here's the cell body, and in the cerebellar cortex, there is a, a single layer of single cells. So it's a layer of Purkinje cell after Purkinje cell, right next to each other. The other remarkable feature about the Purkinje cell is that if you look at it in two different planes, you will see two different appearances. In one, you see the full extent of this dendritic arbor. And then if you turn it on edge, what you see is this, that it's a skinny little flat disc of, an, of a dendritic arbor. How is this oriented in the person? It is oriented, so a student taught me this. I don't think I would ever have remembered this except for a student said, oh, it's oriented like a mohawk. So there you go. It, the, 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 the Purkinje cell is oriented this way. It's got a big arbor this way and a narrow little arbor this way. Okay, I, I'm just guessing you're never going to forget that. I, I never have. All right. Um, so now let's go. Now we're looking at a section through the cerebellum and the medulla. Okay, is everyone oriented? Uh, here are the pyramids. Here are the inferior olives. Uh, there's a little bit of... Um, of deep cerebellar nuclei down here. And then here's the, cere uh, the cerebellar cortex up here. Here's the white matter. You can see this section in here is the vermis. And then this bit over here is the paravermis, and these are the lateral lobes. This person did have an infarct over here. Um, the, uh, one of the points that I want to make is that in this section, the Purkinje cells are lined up in this, like this, like a mohawk. Um, and it is, it is zones of Purkinje cells that all have a, a specific um, job to do. Here is the vermis, here's the paravermis and the lateral lobes. We're now in ponds and you can see the peduncles. And now you can see the elaborate deep cerebellar nuclei, okay? So what happens is that a, is a, a set of Purkinje cells here is going to project to a set of deep cerebellar nuclear neurons here. And then this set is going to project next to it. And the neighbors on this side are going to project to the neighbors on that side. So it's a topographic where there's just a continual mapping of the cerebellar cortex onto the uh, various deep cerebellar nuclei. This deep cerebellar nucleus is called the dentate. Looks like the top of a cow's tooth. Um, and so, and its contour mirrors the contour of the cerebellum itself. You can see that with all these, it looks as though it's the cerebellar contour. So a, a section of Purkinje cells right here may, for example, modulate the rubrospinal control of uh, hip abduction, okay? Or knee flexion, or uh, ankle extension. Um, or it could do that for the lateral corticospinal tract. Or it could do that for the ventral corticospinal tract if it was in the vermis. And so each one of these repeated units is specific to a part of the, a type of movement and a motor control center. And it's going to map onto one of these uh, spots in the deep cerebellar nuclei. 
The other uh, remarkable topography is that you, you might see, you might recognize that this, that this is the inferior olive. This is now a section through the medulla. Remember that this is the pyramid. Here's the fourth ventricle. Here's the hypoglossal nucleus, the restiform body. Um, uh, here's the medial lumniscus. Here is the inferior olive. And what does the inferior olive look like? Well, first of all, it looks like the dentate nucleus, like that cow's tooth. Uh, um, and it also looks like the outline of the, um, of the cerebellar hemispheres. And indeed, this maps on to the contralateral uh, cerebellar hemisphere. So that an area here is going to send a teaching signal to this part of the cerebellum, and then the part next to it will, will teach the cerebellum next to it, and so on. So this is going to progressively map the cerebellum. OK, so in the, in the next uh, video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the types of information that come in to the cerebellum.